Thank you, Jonathan. Some words as we begin our hour together, our hour of worship. Let religion be to us life and joy. Let it be a voice of renewing challenge to the best we have and may be. Let religion be to us dissatisfaction with things that are. Let it be the sorrow that opens the way to sympathy and understanding and service. Let religion be to us the wonder and lure of that which is only partly known and understood. Let it be an eye that glories in nature's majesty and a heart that rejoices in deeds of kindness and courage. Let religion be to us security and serenity because of its truth and beauty. Let it be to us hope and purpose. Religion unites with all that is admirable in human beings everywhere holds before our eyes the prospect of a better life for us all in which each may be part of making it come to be. These hopes are true of every church that seeks to live up to its creed. We hear no less than any other, and we gather here in order to affirm that and remind ourselves of it. Good morning. <laughs> Good, good morning. The sun is out. We had a wonderful week last week of Fountain Off Fountain events. These are our annual, our annual, rather monthly events that take place on the second week, and we do things like discuss books and film and media. Sometimes we participate in happy hours, but the most important thing is that we build and cultivate community outside these beautiful walls. If you had the chance to come to any of them, undoubtedly, you did not miss that at each one of the events, conversations bubbled up about what's next for Fountain Street Church. Particularly, anytime I enter a room, it, 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 you can't avoid it. Somebody says, so have you heard what's going with the search process? Have you heard anything? Have you met anybody yet? Have you met the next leader of Fountain Street Church? Well, I've got great news. I have been meeting with the possible next leaders of this church for months, if not years. I meet with them every Sunday at 11 o'clock on the second floor. I meet with them on Sunday afternoons at the UICA in the public library. I meet with them at Fountain Off Fountain events. The leaders, our children and our youth are in our very midst and they are ready to lead us into the future. They care about the issues we care about, but they have ears and eyes and voices that push us into the future in ways that we simply can't. They care about environmental injustice and racial injustice in our own community. They care about immigration injustice and sexual health. The children and the youth the leaders of this church tomorrow are in our very midst. And yes, you and I have already met them. Next week, we have a baked potato bar. After church, for six bucks, you can get a baked potato. It's a fundraiser. It's an old classic around here. We do it to support the Fountain Club so that they can go on their summer trip. But it's more than just getting full. It's more than just feeling good about raising some extra money for the kids. And it's more than just tokenizing them as, oh, this is so fun, we feel good because we raised money and, and they appreciate it. This is another tangible way that we show them that we affirm that they are our church's next leaders. We're not just going to D.C. because it's something we need to check off our program. We're going to D.C. to talk to our congresspeople about environmental injustice and how it has ramifications right here in our backyard. We're going to D.C. to learn about what social justice looks like in action in a neighborhood and in our own neighborhoods, not just social charity and social service. 
We're going to DC so that we can take something that we bring back to our community inside and outside of these walls that shows that these kids are truly the next leaders in our community. So come, get some potatoes, affirm their leadership among us. My prayer for you this week is you see that this church's next leaders are already in our midst. Be well. Just a couple of quick notes. We have an event that's happening tonight here at the church, which is why the stage was already set up. And that made a perfect opportunity for you to really get a good look at our musicians in a few moments. And for those who don't know, all that cloth over there is to remind us of our growing commitment to serve, support, and affirm LGBTQ plus folks in our midst and around the country. I think we should be as loud as possible in the name of human justice and human rights. And that's just part of what we do. Now I'm supposed to talk about the offering. Now who here is tired of the story of stone soup? You're all, you're all tired of it. So I'll go on. How about, how about this? Sourdough bread. Some of you might remember last spring during Lent, I said, do something different this Lent. Don't you know, do the usual stuff. Take on something physical. And I handed out kits so you could try to make your own sourdough bread. I've stuck with it now. And this came out of the oven this morning. Excellent. Don't applaud, but you are going to get a chance to eat it. Now, I'm reminding you that though I made it, I needed to collaborate with at least a few other things. Yeast, a one-celled animal that is not likely to do what I tell it. Flour, water, salt, and luck. And all of those are not controllable. All I can do is try to gather them together. It's kind of like serving a liberal church. They don't do what I tell them. They do what they want to do anyway. I just try to keep them in bounds. But when we hit the right proportions, something rises. An offering is a reminder that you bring the yeast, the salt, the savor, the the juice to the church. As Christopher just said, it's not the person standing here who is the leader, it's the person sitting there that is leading. We're just the cheerleaders up here. You are the team. You are the church. So, what I'm going to do here is you uh, give your offering. I'm going, to, I'm going to break this into a lot of pieces, and you're free to come and take a piece. And if you want, you're free to stay up here on some of these chairs, because I'm going to be introducing... Uh, the Perugino String Quartet, and a guest in a few minutes. But you made this, not me. You might as well enjoy it. And therefore, your offering is not for others, but for you. And so, ushers, if you're ready, your morning offering, which will rise up and feed thousands, that offering will now be most gratefully received.
see now. I meant, oh, I meant to do that. I needed to remind you that half of our offering every week goes back out to the community. And if you're new to us, you need to know that. We not only support ourselves, but others. I'll go to the next slide in just a moment. So I'm told that um, we're in the second golden age of television. Peak TV, someone called it. I have no idea. Not that I would know because, well, I'm not being a snob. I'm just lazy. It's just too hard to watch TV now. Do you know how many streaming services there are? I can't even count them. And I can't decide which one to get or not. I got my cable, 700 channels of stuff I don't watch. Now, we do have a Netflix account, but I haven't used it for so long I forgot the password. And it turns out that all of this great television is beyond me because my taste in television is really bland. If I have a little bit of Antiques Roadshow, some old movies older than me, and some proven TV classics, I'm good. For example, I don't watch all the new programs. I don't know who us is because I've never been there. I do watch Blackish, but I think that's already passe. But I, anytime there's a MASH rerun, I'm watching it. Now that was a good program. It's not as raw as Fleabag, I understand, and it's not as arch as The Good Place, both of which we have talked about at Fountain Off Fountain. For me, MASH, now 50 years old or very nearly, managed to be both funny and smart and wise. And when it ended, its final episode was the most watched episode in television history from the moment it aired in 1983 until 2010. That was a good program. In fact, Wendy and I, my wife and me, we were so enamored of it that when we were visiting Los Angeles to visit friends, we took a day off to, to walk five miles into Topanga Canyon just so we could stand on the spot where the, where, where the set was. There, see? That's my wife. We're pointing at the, the post there, right? In that, now, in that last episode, it's that last episode that came to me as I was assembling the music of this season. You see, if you don't know, I'm using music as my, my text, my scripture, my foil all year long. But before making the connection, you need to know the piece of music that I'm sharing with you today. One of the earliest recordings I bought as a teenager was one of the Mozart clarinet concerto because my high school band teacher was a clarinetist and he really thought I should listen to it. And he was right. It is fantastic. And on the back of the cover, remember when you had records that were as large as pizzas and they had covers? I feel like I'm talking to people that either remember or don't know what I'm talking about. There was stuff on the back. And you read it. And it turned out, not only did he write a concerto, he wrote a quintet. So I ran out to the library. Remember when you could get records out of the library? Brought it home, and I listened to that, and it was fantastic. And they're rather similar in their quality. And since I could not afford to bring an orchestra and a clarinetist, I decided you should hear the quintet, the Perugino quintet. And Mr. Schenk, Joel Shankman, now let me remind you of the Perugino Quartet, because quartet, they're not just a name, they are people. Stacy and Eric Tanner, who are respectively the first violin and the cellist. Christopher Martin, who is the second violinist, and Barbara Corbato, who is the violist, all of whom are also members of our symphony. Uh, and, they, and the organization's been around for 20 years, so I'm really pleased that we've been able to, to work together. And they will be back doing other things in a week or two or three, but I'm going to ask them if they will begin to come up here on the stage. And you see these other chairs? I want you to come sit with them because if you were here a couple of weeks ago when uh, Christina Fong was playing, I invited people to come and sit close to the music because it's a different experience when you're with them. So please, come on up, grab a piece of bread. Come on, don't be, don't be frightened. No one's going to watch you very much. All right? 
that's a different piece of music. Come on up, and you'll get fed if you come. And as they get in place, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the music as they get set up and they need to tune up. It's about 20 minutes long, so this is kind of more sermon than anything you're going to get today, but it's so good you're not going to mind. The, it comes in four movements. The, first theme, the theme of the first movement is so simple that you don't think it could turn into much, but it does, and it comes back again and again, just four notes, and it marks beginnings and transitions, slightly different each time. You'll recognize it every time you hear it. The second movement is the most famous. It's achingly beautiful due to the way that Mozart uses the tone of the clarinet poised against the filigree of the first violin. And the others, they fill in like a chorus to sustain the long arc of the movement with suspensions and inversions that keep you wanting more and more. The third movement is a playful little minuet, kind of an amuse-bouche after the substantial first and second movements. And in the final movement, you have a series of variations on a very silly little theme. And I've come to the conclusion that Mozart is playing and having fun with the music of his time. He uses the stereotypical sound of the clarinet tooting along, and also the cloying portamento of bad violinists, except in this case, they're beautiful. So he lifts up the stereotypes, shows them as stereotypes, and then yields them back in their true beauty. So, I want you to hear this entire piece all at once, and I want you, then, when they're done, to show appropriate appreciation. And if you want to come up and join them on the stage, you're not, a, you're not prohibited, come on up. And I want to say thank you in advance for the quartet and Mr. Schenkman for blessing us this morning. The Mozart Clarinet Quintet in A Major.
Thank you so much. And I invite you all now to find another seat while I have a few more words to offer. In just a few, but I want you to have these words because the music is so rich that I don't want to take away from that. But now that you've heard this miniature, but nonetheless masterwork, now you need to know why I brought it to you and what came to me because in that last episode of MASH, it features as a piece of music. Let's see if I can get it up there. It has to do with Charles Emerson Winchester III, the cultured Boston Brahmin, who encountered five Chinese musicians who had been taken prisoner and decides they need to know Mozart. Let's see if I have it ready. Nope, that's what we already heard. I'm not sure we can get... The Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, one bar before uh, 120. Ready? Just four for nothing. One, two, three, and. It's kind of cringeworthy when you think about it. Here's this effete New England cultured fellow trying to teach Mozart to five Chinese musicians. And he brings not only his East Coast cultural arrogance, but the arrogance that attaches to classical music itself as being better than other music. And of course, the, uh, there's the whole American arrogance all the time. It's really an uncomfortable, if funny, moment. But the, you see, they're part of a prisoner swap. And so a few minutes later in the episode, they are sent off and, Mr. Win and, and Major Winchester is, in a sense, taken by surprise. What are you doing? Where are you taking these people? I gotta get them to a relocation center, Major. On the line. line. As soon as the truce is signed, these guys gotta be ready for the big switch. We're swapping their prisoners for ours. Yeah, fine. Just leave me five of them. Him, 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 and uh, him. Sorry, Major, they all go. You can't! Not yet! I've come too close to stop now! Okay, move out! How about no one at home? You know each other. just how he feels. But that's only the first part of the story. So far we have him trying to teach Mozart to this group of Chinese folk musicians in the Chinese army. And then they're trying gamely to learn how to do it. And by God, it was still Mozart. It may not have been the way you heard it, but it was still Mozart, wasn't it? But it's the last moment that turns it all upside down and right side out. Toward the end of the episode, a last spasm of fighting sends a final crush of casualties back to the hospital. And here is where it all comes together. Let's see if we can move on to that one. I will take him second. What else you got? This POW over here. He was in the back of the truck when it was hit. Half his chest is gone. Does he even have a pulse? Oh, God. No. 
Is there anything we can do for him, Doctor? Doctor? He wasn't even a soldier. He was a musician. What happened to the other people in the truck with him? He's the only one that made it this far. <sighs> Major. We have to prep the others. Why don't you take a break? It's Winchester's world itself. He has managed to keep the war at a distance from what he values. Culture, especially music, has been his savior. I remember him trying to share Tchaikovsky with a working girl, Caruso with the colonel, Mahler with his tent mates. They all laughed and rejected him and his highfalutin music. But this is what sustains him in the chaos, in the presence of something sublime and beautiful that is beyond the range and reach of savagery and death. This music is his religion. And when the musicians are killed, his faith in that religion and dies with it. I've heard it said that the first casualty of war is truth, the second is surely goodness, and the third certainly is now beauty the platonic trinity, some have called it. When we lose faith in any of those, we lose faith in life itself. I consider this the foundation of all religions, that there's something true and good and beautiful in life and business in the world, and when we don't believe that anymore, we can't believe in anything, and war destroys them all, including our belief in them. But bullets need not fly for us to lose faith in those values. When governments use their power to undermine the truth, when they subvert goodness, when they tell us what is acceptable as art, when we begin to doubt those values as well, the war is already lost. Now, I tried to spend an hour or two or three in the last two days trying to frame a nice general argument for this, but I can't. I'm going to be very blunt and straightforward. The news that the administration of our government wants to limit federal construction to neoclassical designs signals the final abandonment of any value whatsoever that this government claims to have. We've already seen the dismissal of truth and goodness as pertinent to the business of government. There is no deception or prevarication it will not employ, either to evade the truth or to confuse us with alternatives to it. There is no misbehavior, even to the edge of treason, that is considered wrong by this administration. Like Winchester witnessing the insanity of war, there was only one place left for me, beauty, where a soul could go and think there was something immune to this moral coronavirus. But it was not. And it isn't. Beauty is not immune. Winchester learned it in the phony war that we knew was real. And we are learning it now. This administration considers truth and goodness and beauty as weapons to be used in a perpetual war for maintaining political dominance. Mere means to be used, not values to be served. When any government, including ours, seeks to subvert the true and the good and the beautiful, it destroys both those values and our belief in them as such. And now you know why I am calling this sermon what it is. Our administration is a clear and present danger to our society because it is literally at war with the human spirit. But I am not hopeless, though I am getting closer. 
I was in Cape Town, South Africa last May, and I saw rock paintings by the ancient ancestors of the Khoisan people, the indigenous humans of that region. Some think the earliest form of human life. Centuries old stick figures etched or painted on rocks, painted with dye, not the thing you would consider Michelangelo at all, and yet beautiful in ways that Michelangelo is not. Because these were people for whom staying alive was a daily challenge, and yet they found it necessary to paint their faces, their beings, their animals, their lives, even in the midst of a survival. Something deeply mattered to them that required making it, creating something real. People will never stop making art or telling the truth or being good. Though all our governments be at war against it, we know we shall prevail because people will etch something, they will sing something, they will say something, and it will be heard and seen and felt. Something that says there is more more than this at stake. I know governments and wars have obliterated art for centuries, but never ultimately, and neither shall this one. Mozart will not perish, nor any other great art or beauty. The only question is how long before we end the assault on it. I got out my calendar. You have 260 days to decide. After that, it's another four years. I leave it to you. And with gratitude toward this wonderful quintet for reminding me that beauty still matters, I ask that these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight, thou who art my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I crave now the blessing of our ancestors as well, who etched upon these walls and sung, upon, sung in these rooms and gave of their words and lives to make a better world through their truth and goodness and beauty. Those whose lives have gone before at this time in years past, David Jacobs, Jack White, and Lars Gilson, God filled with mercy dwelling in the heaven's heights, bring proper rest beneath the wings of your Shekinah to the souls of our beloved who have gone to their eternal rest. May you who are the source of mercy shelter them beneath your wings eternally, bind their souls to we the living and to you that they may rest in peace and let us say amen. Fear not, sorrow will one day turn to joy, says Paul Robeson, and all that breaks the heart and oppresses the soul will one day give place to peace and understanding and everyone will be free. If not today, then another day. How long, Lord, not long. Let us make sure it is as close as it can be, knowing that this and every day is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And until we meet again, amen and amen.